Welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hey everyone, welcome back to OnScript. This is Matt Lynch coming to you from Regent College in Vancouver. A uh, quick reminder that we have another podcast too, Biblical World, which focuses on the history, culture, context of the Bible and really uh, fantastic episodes over there if you want to check them out. Uh, this is the second that uh, episode that we've done with Jason Staples about his new book and uh, follow up on the previous one. So I hope you enjoy it. And thanks for listening. Thanks to you, those of you who support the podcast through giving or sharing the word or whatever it is you might do to to help others learn about OnScript. So uh, we appreciate that and any work you can do there. We're grateful for that. All right, enjoy this episode. Welcome back, friends, to OnScript. This is Matthew Bates of Northern Seminary, along with Aaron Heim, who is at Wycliffe Hall, Oxford. Jason Staples is with us again. Previously, we were discussing Jason's book, Paul and the Resurrection of Israel, Jews, Former Gentiles, Israelites, published by Cambridge University Press. Jason, I thought we were rid of you. What are you doing back here again? Uh, I think there was a clerical error of some sort. And uh, based on the sirens I just heard as you did that stellar introduction, uh, and maybe maybe they're coming to get me now. So. <laughs> well, Jason, the reason we brought you back was twofold. Uh, on, on the one hand, your book is super important and interesting, so it's fun to just keep on chatting about it with you. Uh, but second, I think one of the book's strengths is its close reading of Paul. It's a very exegetical book. Uh, and you're reading Paul in light of Second Temple Jewish texts. So we wanted the chance to delve more specifically into exegetical details in this episode. Let me try to recap just very briefly book one, and then you can tell me where I need more nuance. Uh, so let's try that just briefly then. So um, you're arguing in uh, uh, your book, Paul and the Resurrection of Israel, that uh, I- the language of Israel is very important to Paul, uh, and it doesn't mean the same thing as Jew. And that Paul sees uh, a spiritual change happening that transforms uh, the Gentiles who are part of the nations into Israel as the Spirit is given. And you also think that that's important for rereading Paul on a detailed level, and you offer a theological reading of Paul. What do you want to add to that? Um, I think that's a pretty good summary to to start with, it, just the uh, the sense that Paul understands Jesus' death and resurrection as having initiated the 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 promises that were made to Israel through the prophets and in the Torah, and that the uh, the changed hearts, the ethical transformation that had been promised to Israel, and the full ingathering of all of Israel, meaning all twelve tribes of Israel, uh, was was underway, and that that ultimately is sort of the center, the core. Uh, the coherent core at the at the center of what Paul is actually preaching, and that the in in gathering of the nations is actually fundamental to that whole uh, that whole thing with the nations themselves undergoing this ethical and ethnic transformation uh, that sort of reverses the the prior death of at least a portion of Israel uh, that that had been gentilized as it were. Uh, they had assimilated among the nations after disobedience, so uh, we can unpack that more uh, exegetically later. But I think that's the basic that's the basics of it. Thanks again, Jason, for joining us, and we're so glad that you're back. Um, I'm going to kick us off on an exegetical question on the back of what you've just said. So Paul has the statement in Romans nine six. First, he says. Uh, It's not as though the word of God has failed. And then he has this phrase, which I'm going to read in Greek because I'll let you translate it. He says, Ugar pantes hoi ex Israel, hutoi Israel. So how do you translate that phrase? And then second, um, what does Israel mean here? And indeed, you know, for the rest of Romans 9 through 11 or maybe even in all of Paul. Yeah, this is tricky. And and, and in many respects, this is the thesis statement, I think, for... Uh, Romans 9 to 11. I mean, he sets off the, this section of Romans with this specific thesis statement saying, okay, it, you know, it's not as though God's word has failed because, and then this, and then he explains what that means through the next three chapters, which are really complicated. Uh, my, now, my rendering of that, uh, if I have room to explain it, I'll, I'll kind of uh, 
render it one way. If I have to, if I have to do it for a you know polished translation, it's another. But uh, basically, the the way I understand this is for it is not all who are from Israel. Those these ones are Israel. Uh, that's that's kind of how I, I I understand that, uh, which is to say, uh, there's a distinction between those who are from Israel. This is ex Israel. This is uh, the people who are descended from the patriarch Israel. That is Jacob. Not everybody who's descended from Israel is Israel in this sense. Uh, And that immediately lays out (laughs) a problem that Israel doesn't always mean the same thing. And that's true in Paul. And that's true also in in Paul's Bible, in in, uh, you know, the Torah and the prophets. When you read Israel in Genesis, Israel is the patriarch. When you read the uh, Israel in the in the Torah, Israel's the twelve tribes. When you read Israel in Second Kings, it's usually talking about the northern kingdom of Israel and not the southern kingdom of Judah. Though sometimes all Israel refers to all twelve, and then you see in the prophets this uh, expectation of a restoration of Israel uh, that has some. There's some question as to who actually is involved in this Israel, because when you read, say, Isaiah, Isaiah says the remnant will be saved. Well, okay, so who actually entails the the, the remnant or the part that's left over, which is what the remnant means. So after judgment, after God has culled part of the of the people, which is, you know, what Isaiah's prophesying is going to happen. Uh, he says, you know, only a stump is going to be left, basically. Well, okay, so you have the stump that's left, but he says a remnant will be saved. Okay, so who actually is ultimately, in the end, the part that's left over from Israel? And Paul is is engaging with all of those here and saying, okay, in the grand scheme of things, when all is said and done, Not everyone who's descended from Israel will be a part of the group that is promised that that receives the promises to Israel that are heirs to the to Israel and to the promises of Abraham, essentially. Uh, So I think that's what he what he does. So um, what he carves out in Romans nine to 11 is a historical case working from the patriarch Israel where you have, you know, it it, rather it is. It is through Isaac that you're, it's actually from Abraham and then working to Israel. It is through Isaac that your seed will be reckoned. And then uh, Jacob rather than Esau. And he's saying, you know, this has never been just about biological descent. Otherwise, Ishmael and Esau and so on would would be heirs every bit as much as those from Israel. Uh, So he he works from that, that point, from the patriarchs through the the people Israel all the way up to God's divorce statement in Hosea, and then pass that to Ho- to God's promise of restoration to not my people, the people that God divorced, which then Paul sort of curiously applies to Gentiles, even though he knows based on what you've seen all the way up to that point, he knows full well that that is prophesied to Israel. So then, how does that apply to Gentiles? Then he develops that in the remaining portions of, of nine to 11. But essentially he's trying to make the case that Israel has always in, in in terms of who actually inherits the promise has always been about more than just a descent from a biological perspective. It's something else. And he wants to explain how that's working in light of his gospel, essentially. Thanks. That's helpful. Can I just follow up then and and ask about, um, so you're saying it's more than biological descent. Um, do you see biological descent in this phrase in 9-6 at all? Um, and then a subversion of it in some sense uh, in the Hutu Israel or... Um, and, and I suppose the the fundamental question then is 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 nine six already inclusive of Gentiles in your view? So I think the the ex Israel is 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 specifically talking about descent. So those who are from Israel, and when when we see this this ex or ex Israel, Paul calls himself a a, a Hebrew from Hebrews, right? So he's a uh, someone who's been speaking a Semitic tongue in you know from from birth because he was born to Semitic speakers, 
Uh, this is a, a term of, of dissent. Uh, and then the, these ones are Israel. I don't think he, at that point has already put the Gentiles in that, in that context in nine, six, I think he, he sort of holds that back to explain, okay, well, if it's not just about dissent, then what does that, what are the implications of that? I think he, I think he explains that later, but the, the bigger thing in nine, six is, okay, how is it the case that there are those who are cut off from Israel who are not participating in this phenomenon uh, in, in the promise that we're seeing. And he says, well, I mean, that's, that's sort of the way things have always been. Uh, and he traces through the, the, the history of God's dealing with the descendants of Abraham saying lots of descendants of Abraham from the beginning have not been included because of a variety of different reasons. So I think that's where he starts with that. And then he proceeds to argue for an overarching fidelity of God towards his people that that goes beyond just the the uh, the physical descent to actually incorporate more than just those who are from who are physically and biologically descended from Israel such that this ends up being more uh, more inclusive in some sense than rather than less and that's sort of the surprising turn that we see in Romans 9 to 11 as he as he explains this further. So Israel doesn't have a, a fixed reference for you then. So when you get to Paul's statement at the end of 11, or well, toward the end of 11, all, you know, in this way, all Israel will be saved. That one is inclusive. Do I have you right on that? So I think by then he's explaining that in order for all Israel to be saved, you have to have people from the nations included. Yes. So that is inclusive of at least some from the nations, though I don't think he's arguing that the Gentiles sort of writ large... Uh, have to be included in the same way. It's the fullness of the nations, you know, the fullness of uh, of the Gentiles that have to be included, which I think is a little bit different. So, but yeah, I do think that's where by the time he gets you there, he's explained why people from the nations have to be included for Israel to be complete. Yeah, well, that's a helpful clarification of Paul's Israel language, obviously at the heart of your thesis. Um, another uh, really critical idea for you has to do with New Covenant and um, you know ethical transformation in connection with that. I was going to take us to a different text and uh, on the one hand probe 2 Corinthians 3, 6, but then see if we can deepen that and talk about uh, a famous exegetical puzzle in Paul uh, having to do with Moses and the veil. What is Moses doing? So in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul writes, God has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Let's begin with um, just a conversation about new covenant. How is that understood within Second Temple Judaism, for instance, at Qumran? And what's Paul trying to say then in setting up this conversation about Moses? Yeah, I think first and foremost, we have to remember that that new covenant is a uh, it's a distinctive phrase that appears that comes from Jeremiah 31 or 38 in the Septuagint, but 31, 31 to 34, where, you know, God says in, in, in those days, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant uh, or, or not like the covenant, which I made with their fathers when I led them by the hand out of Egypt, the covenant, which they broke, but this will be the covenant that I will make with them in those days. I will write my law on their hearts. Right? So this whole, this whole thing, goes back to that passage. This language goes back to that passage. Uh, and a first, first thing, it's important to remember that this is a covenant that's made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, right? So this is, this is language that talks about all 12 tribes, essentially about the whole group that comprises or, or that, that composes uh, the, the, the whole of Israel rather than you know, you get a lot of people today that just presume like the new covenants with the nations, but we don't get that. And when you read, you, you brought it, brought up the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. When you read the Dead Sea Scrolls, they see this as the full restoration, the promised restoration of the whole people of Israel, of which their group, as they're beginning to uh, receive the revelation of God and, and observing Torah the right way, their group is the beginning stages of, and they're beginning, they're beginning this process of repentance that's sort of the vanguard of this restoration. This is going to bring about, in some sense, this final restoration. And this whole this whole new covenant 
promise sort of presumes a framework in which Israel, uh, as the, the 12 tribe people, had broken covenant with, with God, and that that had resulted in com- coming under the covenantal curses, the final curses of which were exile and death, both individual and corporate. So the, the people essentially die as a people. This is, you know, standard uh, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy uh, 26 to, to 20, 29, all of that. Uh, but at the same point, there's a promise of covenant renewal. Adonai will restore his people. So along with that, though, the new covenant promise, and then there's a related set of uh, what I call a nexus of restoration passages that go along with this. So, Deuter- uh, so Deuteronomy 30, Exodus 36, 24 and following, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Paul interprets those uh, that passage together with the new covenant passage in second Corinthians three, uh, and puts those two together. So the new heart and new spirit is the law written on the heart is the new covenant, all of that. Uh, but then the restoration, the promise of restoration, the promise of this new covenant, what it does is it's not just about restoring the people in a physical sense, but it's rather fixing the central problem that had led to coming under the covenantal curses in the first place. And that's Israel's chronic disobedience. So exile and death were the consequence of disobedience. So that disobedience has to be fixed in order for Israel's restoration to be lasting. In other words, uh, Israel's restoration requires Israel's justification. Israel has to be made into doers of justice, people who do the will of God. And we see this in Deuteronomy, for example, in Deuteronomy 29.3, which in English translation is uh, 29.4, Moses tells the people, to this day, Adonai has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. Now, that's really important because it turns out you you need those things to, to really fully obey. And then we read in Jeremiah 24.7, keep that in mind, Moses has just said to the people, Adonai has not given you a heart to know. Jeremiah 24, seven says, I will give them a heart to know me and they will be my people and I will be their God and they will return to me with their whole heart. That's completely Deuteronomic language saying that what they've not gotten in Deuteronomy is what they're going to get at some point in the future. And this maps perfectly onto Deuteronomy 36. I don't know. Your God will circumcise your hearts or your heart and the hearts of your seed to love Adonai, your God, with all your heart and all your soul so that you may live, that you may receive life, right? And of course, this is alluding to the Shema. The Shema is, you know, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one, and you will love the Lord your God, you will love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your soul, right? But they didn't do that. They broke the covenant. They broke. They did not love Adonai, their God, exactly as Moses in Deuteronomy had said would be the case. I know he says you will, you will, you will break this Torah and you will come under the curses that I've said. So interestingly, this is what Paul is, is referencing early in in Romans when he talks about it is not the hearer, not the one who hears like in the Shema, but the doer who is justified, but the doing has to, has to come from having received that changed heart. That is exactly what Deuteronomy promises and then what Jeremiah promises and Ezekiel promises and so on. So Paul then proclaims that this promise of a new heart, a new spirit, the Torah written on the heart, the circumcision of the heart is being fulfilled through his gospel in those who are receiving the spirit poured out on those who have committed their fidelity or their their allegiance, if you will, uh, their, their allegiance to Jesus. And Jesus is the one who has received the authority to pour out that spirit because of his obedience to the cross. And so in all of this ends up coming back to this receiving something different in the heart, a a transformation of the heart that enables full obedience to God in a way that the written Torah had not. And the written Torah itself in Deuteronomy repeatedly says that it had not and points towards this future moment when that capacity is going to be granted to the whole people. And Paul is saying, this is what's happening now through the spirit. Thank you. How does he then apply this new covenant framework specifically to the issue of Moses and veiling? What does he think Moses is doing with this veil? And then the veil 
appears not only just over Moses's face, but over the reader's heart. Uh, and this is in Second Corinthians three. What's Paul doing with the veil language? <laughs> this is really hard. This is actually one of the passages that I found most difficult when I was going through this. Uh, actually, after I'd submitted this this book to to um, review when I, when I'd submitted the the dra- the final draft of it, I actually went back and spent like six or eight weeks just working through this passage over and over and over again and re and ended up redoing that whole, that whole section in, in this book, because I, I felt like I it's like, man, I've, I'm almost there, but I feel like I'm missing something. And finally s- some stuff cracked toward the end. And I was able to rev- completely revise uh, where I wanted to go with this. But it took a while. Uh, one thing that I think is important to start with is that Paul does not contrast spirit and Torah or spirit and law here. It's really interesting that he avoids that in his language, but he, he does contrast letter and spirit. And those are different. He, he doesn't want to challenge the, the, the importance of Torah or law, but it's a matter of what, which law, what is the, uh, the domain that we're talking about? Are we talking about the domain of letter or the domain of spirit? And this all depends on a distinction that we see elsewhere in early Jewish literature. And that is a distinction between the heavenly Torah and the written uh, approximation of the heavenly Torah, the written, uh, the written version of the Torah. So we see something similar in Hebrews 8, 5. The earthly temple is a pattern and shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. Just as Moses was warned, see that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain, right? So what Moses sees, what Moses experiences when he goes on to the mountain is the the thing itself, the heavenly Torah. He's there. He sees the heavenly tabernacle. He's, it, it's, it's the actual thing. And then what does he do? He's supposed to take a copy of this down and make a copy of it so that people could kind of get the gist of what he had seen (laughs) on the mountain. And this all then goes back to Exodus 19, when all the people are called up onto the mountain to meet God. And then only Moses ascends onto the mountain to meet God. Everybody else shrinks back and stays at the foot of the mountain. And this is what Hebrews is talking about as well. When Hebrews says, we are not of those who shrink back, right? When they go up, when Moses goes up onto the mountain, only Moses ascends to that heavenly glory. And the people at that point designate Moses as their enemy intermediary. They say, you know, don't let us hear God again directly, lest we die. You, Moses, you go up there, you hear from God, and then you come back and you tell us what he says, and we'll listen to you. And they, they, that's the arrangement that they make. And actually Moses in Deuteronomy summarizes this this way. He says, I was standing between Adonai and you at that time to declare to you the word of Adonai because you were afraid due to the fire and you did not go up onto the mountain. This is not how it was supposed to be, right? And so what Moses then does is he sees the thing itself. He experiences the thing itself. He receives the direct glory of God and then takes an image, an approximation of that full revelation down to the people, both in the sense of the tabernacle and Paul's arguing in the letter that he then delivers to the people in written form. And interestingly, in Deuteronomy 5, Adonai agrees with the people, by the way, when they say, lest we die. Adonai says to Moses says, Adonai said to me, I've heard the sound of the words of this people, which they've spoken to you. They've they've said well in what they've spoken. If only they had such a heart in them to fear me and always to keep my commands so that it would go well with them and their children forever. This is God's like wish which is phenomenal. Like it's a a crazy thing to hear, like wishful thinking from God. But then by the end of Deuteronomy, this is what we see promised is that God is going to make them a people that do have a heart in them to fear him and to always keep his commands. But in the interim between then and, and the time that Moses is talking, God gives them a limited attenuated revelation that they could handle, which includes a, an earthly tabernacle and a written Torah which has the limitations of language. Language is always a step removed from the thing itself, right? We, we've all had that experience of trying to describe something and just not having the words to be able to do it. And Paul is arguing that the Torah itself, the written Torah, 
has this limitation that it's an approximation. It's an attenuation of the real full heavenly reality. And, and Moses also says that the Torah is given as a witness against Israel until the full promise is completed because Israel is going to break it and therefore die, right? See, I set before you life and death, right? This is Deuteronomy 30. And then when you get into 31 and 32, he says, and you are going to get the death out of it. So this is what, what Paul means when Moses is a minister of death. Paul gives a written Torah that the people are not going to keep as a witness against them until the full promise of the changed hearts is, is actually completed and received. So, th and this is what Paul says is, is happening now. The person then who goes through the written Torah is looking at Moses. Moses, when he's in the presence of God, unveils his face, and then he shines with the glory of God. And then when he turns to the people, the people can't handle the glory of God. So he covers his face. They shrink back from him initially in the passage when he, when he comes down and his face is glowing. So he covers his face, shielding them out of protection from the glory of God that is emanating from him now. And in the same way, you get the, the, the veil in, in, the, uh, in the tabernacle as well. The, the, the veil is there as protection for a fleshly people from coming into direct contact with the glory of God, which in the absence of themselves being spiritually transformed would bring about death. And so what, uh, what Moses does is he covers himself over and, and veils himself for the same reason there was a veil in the tabernacle, the same reason there's a great darkness around the glory on Sinai. This is a protection for a fleshly people who can't handle that glory. And similarly, the, the, the written Torah, the letter is mediated, attenuated and approximated as all language has to be. And any reader of the Torah is going through Moses Meaning, instead of going directly to God, you're going through Moses, and Moses is veiled, which means you're not actually seeing the full revelation. You're you're seeing the, the you know the mediated portion of that. And what Paul says happens when a person receives the Spirit is that they turn away. They're no longer facing Moses. Now they've turned and they're facing God, standing next to Moses, as though they were in the place of Moses, receiving the same revelation of the thing itself that Moses himself saw. So now the, uh, the veil comes off and now you're directly facing God and you're seeing the thing itself that Moses approximates in the letter written in the written Torah. And I think that, and this is why he says, you know, when, when, the, when he turns to, and it's actually ambiguous in the language, is it talking about Moses when he, when Moses turns to the Lord or when the person with the spirit turns to the Lord and it actually works both ways because that's how it worked for Moses. And he's saying, this is what's happened now for those who've received the spirit. You've turned to face the Lord and now you're face to face in that way. And you're, you're, you're receiving the, the, uh, the glory of God in an, in an unmediated or not exactly unmediated because it's mediated through through Christ, but Christ himself is the glory of God in this sense. Um, but you're receiving this spiritual thing itself rather than the, the, the approximation. And like I said, this is not unique to Paul. We see in the book of Jubilees, you see in, in, in Philo, you see some of these other uh, second temple Jewish thinkers talking about this distinction between the heavenly Torah and then what Moses gives to the people, which is, it's great. It's a, it's, it's a representation of that heavenly Torah, but it's not the thing itself. And Paul's saying those who have the spirit receive the thing itself, and they are able to be taught directly by God in each instance. A written Torah can only a, a deal with examples that you have to extrapolate from. When you have the spirit, Paul's saying you have guidance on every little piece of all of life for every case, and that you're, you're in contact with the very thing that Moses saw. So I think that's the basics of what's going on in that passage. Yeah, thanks, Jason. That's really helpful. I think I'm going to ask another question about um, the spirit, if that's okay. As long as we're talking about the spirit, I'm going to ask my question about 
um, the spirit of adoption that Paul talks about in Romans 8.15. Um, so in 8.15, he says to his audience, and it'd be great to hear what you think, who you think he's talking to at that point. Um, so he says to his audience, you've received the spirit of adoption, um, not a spirit of slavery to fall again into fear, but spirit of adoption or sonship or huithsia. And then in 8.23, he says that those with the spirit are groaning inwardly, eagerly awaiting their adoption, the redemption of the body. Um, given that you've talked a bit about resurrection in your book in a way that's probably not the way that people think you might be talking about it, I'd love to hear what you um, have to say about adoption and the redemption of the body that seems to have a physical body in mind. And then it, Paul says it one more time in Romans, in Romans 9.4, where he says that um, his, kin, his kinsfolk according to the flesh are Israelites to whom belongs the adoption, which has always kind of puzzled me since he's just said that they were kinsfolk according to the flesh, but then they also have adoption. Um, and I think this is also a place where it's always, it struck me as interesting that um, people who have written on this and want to argue very strongly for a spiritual inclusion of the Gentiles, um, like Carolyn Johnson Hodge, um, even Matthew Thiessen, um, they don't talk very much about Romans 9.4. So I'd love to hear what you think Paul is doing with this huithesia in Romans 9.4 and how it relates to um, 8.15 and 8.23. Yeah, this one, wow, we could do like three episodes on this and it's uh, it's too much. Um, <laughs> so uh, first of all, I do think it's important to mention that in Romans 9.4, He's not saying that these that that his kins, kinsmen according to the flesh actually possess adoption, but he's saying that it's their rightful, like they it, it's it's theirs. They should have it. And I think the the thing that he's he's expressing grief over in the beginning of Romans nine is that many of his kin according to the flesh are not in position to actually have it at this point. And Why do you think saying, he thinks you know, they need it? Look, it's rightfully theirs. They should have this. And yet that's the, that's the thing. So this gets to what I think the adoption that he's talking about is. And that is, I think ultimately when Paul talks about adoption in these passages, I think he's referring to becoming children of God in a cosmic sense. So the, you know, the, the phrase sons of God is, is a phrase that appears what six times I think in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and it appears a number of other times in, in, uh, in other early Jewish literature. And it's a phrase that refers to heavenly or spiritual powers, right? These are the, the, you know, they're, they're pneuma beings. They're, they're, uh, they're spiritual beings that are, uh, you know, cosmic, cosmic powers. And I, I think Paul reads God's promise to Abraham, uh, of look at the stars. So shall your seed be as a promise, not only about quantity of descendants, but quality that God will make Abraham's seed like the stars of the sky in that they will be children of God, uh, with eternal life, spiritual existence, you know, they will be adopted into the cosmic heavenly sphere sphere and made like God himself. So they will not just be fleshly, you know, animal, animal embodied creatures, meat bags. If you want to go star Wars on this, you know, the extended Canon, um, they're not just, uh, uh, fleshly, but rather become this eternal substance that is God's stuff. They, they share in the, uh, <laughs> to bring in later language, the usia of God, uh, they, they become like God. Uh, and so I think this is what he's referring to with adoption is this is adoption into, into godhood, essentially something like that. And so, and this promise is specifically to Abraham and to Abraham's seed. So it's rightfully the possession of those who are heirs of Abraham, that is Israel. And those who come into Israel and remain in Israel to the end are ultimately adopted as children of God, receiving that heavenly life. So when you look at the olive tree, the, the olive tree itself, uh, we, we see at the end of, of Romans 11, in that olive tree, you have those who are natural branches, who are you know just the outgrowth of the, the biological processes of the tree, and then those who are grafted in. But the whole tree ultimately, and again, now we're going to mix metaphors, and Paul's not you know, afraid to mix metaphors himself, but we're going to mix metaphors. All who come into that tree then are 
ultimately adopted into this divine identity to be heirs of the heavenly realm and to be uh, actual, you know, children of God in the divine sense. So I think that's what he's talking about when he talks about adoption, which is why at the end of Romans eight, when he talks about groaning for this adoption, and this is connected with like the full redemption of all of creation and, you know, resurrection and all of this, this is the reception of the divine spiritual body at the resurrection, like what Jesus has now. That's, that's how he understands this. At least that's my reading of adoption and that becoming a part of the people of Israel puts a person in the position to be adopted as such. And then after the resurrection, then those people are, and the, the, you, we could get all the way into like the cosmology of all of this, of the stars are, are, you know, gods essentially, and govern over, you know, this, this mortal space and all of that. Essentially the people of God take the role of the gods in that sense. They become children of God and part of the heavenly court of the God of Israel, essentially. And the God of Israel being above all of the gods and the, the adoption involves uh, the people of God becoming that. I think that's what's going on here. So you would see spirit as being a heavenly substance then, um, not to deny that it's a person or personal, uh, but a heavenly substance that brings about this transformation, I, I take it. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And, and again, you know, God himself is spirit. And then those who become adopted receive the same spirit that God himself is. Now, you know, that's a that's mysterious language uh, that, that, you know, it's it's wrapped up in, in, in a way that we can't really get across all that well. Again, we're running into the problem of words, but the basic idea here is that it's participation in the life of God himself that Paul's talking about here, I think. Can I just ask a, a quick follow-up question? Um, I think I think one of the reasons that I've not sort of gone down that track in my own writing on adoption is because I can't quite make it work with Galatians um, 5. Because there it seems to me that because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts. And so it seems like, and that's, you know, that's quite a, I mean, it's, maybe it seems like a pedantic point, but there it seems like adoption precedes the giving of the spirit. It doesn't affect the sonship, if you will. So um, I I wonder what you make of that text and why, why if it's the case that adoption is about um, this pneumatological transformation in Galatians, does he not keep that order? Yeah. So again, how did they become sons though in Galatians, right? He, he starts with this whole thing of, you know, having begun in the spirit, are you now going to be completed or perfected in the flesh? They're not, they're really not sons prior to receiving the spirit, but he, I think is, is sort of coupling these two things together the, of look, because you're sons, because God has appointed you to be sons, this is why he's set, sent his spirit. So I think this is all connected that way. Um, and it has to do with the sort of logical order of it in, in, that can kind of go both ways in, in, uh, in how he explains it. But I, I do think that those two things are tied in a way that you can't really separate them for, for Paul. Uh, think about it this way. Um, when, when does a person become a parent? Does a person become a parent by having children or does having children make a person a parent? Well, I think what's interesting right, about adoption is that it seems like you become a parent by decree. Like it's not, it's a decree that's transformative. Yes, I mean, I see what you're saying, but also it's just interesting that that language, it's its quite a different thing than kind of a metaphysic or ontological transformation of the thing itself, which I, I mean, like as an adopted person, I find interesting. Like I didn't become somebody else, you know what I mean? Like in adoption, that doesn't make me something else inherently. I mean, unless we're going to talk about relational ontology. Yeah, so I, I would push back a little bit on the on the the distinction between declaring something something and uh and actually the the process of transformation because i think for paul oh i agree god's speech is not just declarative it's actually performative so when god's 
when, when God says something is the case, he actually makes it that way. And so there is an actual transformation of a person when God actually does this. Now, in, in human adoption, you know, it's a shadow of the larger thing in, in that sense. Uh, and, you know, it, it, if I if I become a member of another family and, you know, my dad is adopted as well. Uh, if I become a member of another family, there are certain aspects of me that that don't change. And that's probably true. I mean, if we want to talk about uh, about divine adoption, I mean, that seems to me to, there, there seems to me to be a, a factor of that or an aspect of that that we retain in co- becoming children of God. We we retain who we are, but who we are is also transformed in a in in an ontological sense as well as a relational one. Because when we come into relationship with an ontologically different entity by receiving the thing that makes that that entity or that being ontologically that being you know if we become if we become partakers of the usia of the of the divine then we become something else but we also seem to me it seems to me we still re- remain ourselves in some sense we don't become like incorporated in, incorporated into god such that we become god indistinguishably from god himself we become children of god which seems to re- retain some distinction between us as creation and God as creator. Nevertheless, we share in the same life as God as creator. So I think that's what he's trying to do. Sure. And we could talk about this. I mean, there's a lot there. I think I would just want to say that when like, when you say that the decree of God to make something, I think that's true. And so, um, and I don't necessarily think then we also need to have like the spirit being the one who transforms flesh in the midst. I mean, so in Galatians, I read that sequentially. So God has pronounced adoption. And so God sends the spirit um, in that text. And, you know, obviously there are, I think, arguments to be made um, on that side too, but I won't make them because this is your podcast. So um, I'll turn it over to Matt. <laughs> yeah, well, let's keep it in Galatians, and uh, we're we'll do an alternative speed round here, here for you, Jason, an exegetical one. Oh my goodness! This is not totally unfair to you since we asked you to prepare um, uh, Galatians three ten through fourteen, but it's a very challenging text. So you'll have to just be quick and give your responses exegetically to how you want to read these without maybe fully defending. <laughs> what do you think about that? Are you up for up for at least t- attempting <laughs> I'm up this? For it. Okay, um, so. Uh, you're you know, as part of your your overall argument you're trying to clarify what paul means by um the the enig- enigmatic phrase tell us namu uh in romans 10 4 right and you're talking about like how the messiah could be the end of the law what that even might mean right and as part of that then you you walk through the sequence of galatians um 3 10 through 14 in uh your book and it's exegetically dense rich passage but i'll go ahead and read parts of it in english uh and you give um maybe a response to how you would want to nuance. Uh, So here it starts out, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Now that phrase rely on is a bit loaded in English. In in Greek, it just says for as many as are by works of law or from works of law, right? Uh, Anyway, how how do you make sense of that passage in Deuteronomy uh, 27, 26? So first of all, I think that, that that verse in particular is talking about how Israel broke the covenant and came under the curse of the Torah and that the curse itself in Deuteronomy applies not only to the distinct individuals who break the Torah, but also has corporate downstream effects. So in Deuteronomy 28, uh, what, 58, 59, uh, you have uh, God say, if or Moses says, if you do not follow, follow all the words of this Torah written in this book, Adonai will cause extraordinary pl- uh, plagues on you and on your seed. So uh, specifically, uh, he will disperse you into all the nations and you will be subject to other gods. So the curse is laid not only on those who disobey, but also on their seed who remain under that curse. And they remain under slavery to other peoples and their gods, which is exactly what Paul then goes on to explain later on in Galatians until the redemption that's promised in Deuteronomy 30, which is what Paul is saying has been is happening through Jesus' death and resurrection. So anyone who aims to join the people of God through the flesh, that is by circumcision, is thereby entering a covenant that has already been broken. And then that means that 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 doesn't solve anything for that person. That only puts the person right back into the same 
need for redemption under the same covenantal curse as the rest of the people, the very curse that God or that, that Paul says uh, God sent Jesus to save his people from. So getting circumcised to do that doesn't solve the problem. It just puts you in exactly the same spot that you were before. All right, next part then. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because, quote, the righteous will live by faith, quoting Habakkuk 2.4. So, yeah, like many other interpreters, I, I take this as primarily, first and foremost, a proof text about Jesus, who is the righteous one or the just one, to whom life was promised. So Christ lives because of his fidelity demonstrated by the cross, and his resurrection is proof that he is the just one who is who is now alive. And this is how Paul uses Habakkuk 2.4 in Romans 1. So in Romans 1.4, the resurrection is the proof of Jesus' status. And he says, this is in fulfillment of the prophetic promise, and then cites Habakkuk 2.4. Now, some might ask, doesn't this apply to believers? Well, yes, it does. But secondarily, because the believer receives and lives in accord with Christ's fidelity, the believer takes it receives the fidelity of Christ and then lives in accord with that and then participates in Christ's faith or Christ's fidelity and then receives the same life as Christ himself in consequence. So I think that's what he's talking about here. Yeah, we're, we're lock and step on that point for sure. All right, the next one, the law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Leviticus 18.5. Okay, so first of all, I want to emphasize that this verse does not stand opposite or against the prior verse. Paul's not quoting Leviticus 18.5 over and against Habakkuk 2.4 as though he wants to undermine the Torah, which to me is baffling that people think that Paul is citing the Torah in order to undermine it. But whatever. Um, so Paul, what Paul does here is he points out that the Torah was not given from fidelity. It was not based on Israel's fidelity, but rather because of the opposite, which is what he says in 319, a few verses later, the Torah was given because of transgression. The written Torah is a contingency due to disobedience and is a guardian to govern the flesh until the flesh is dealt with through the cross. Secondly, I don't think it should be translated on the contrary, it says here, I think that implies the wrong break in the argument. So I think what the, the way to take this uh, is better. Uh, the Torah is not from fidelity, so it didn't result from fidelity, but the one who does these things will live by them. So he cites the Torah or he cites that passage not as a uh, as a way to undermine Torah, but rather to say the Torah still, even if it wasn't even though it wasn't given from fidelity, it still promises life to the one who does these things. Now, the one who does these things is the one who lives and that Jesus is the one who does these things or who did these things is evident from the resurrection. And Paul signals exactly who he means by the one who does these things by the very next word that appears after the quotation of Leviticus 18.5. The one who does these things will live by them. Christ is the very next word. And I think that's on purpose. He does this also in Romans, uh, Romans 10, where, you know, uh, Christ is the end of the Torah. And then he explains what's going on there. The, 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 the wording here is always to highlight who is the one who fulfills how all this works. And Jesus is that the one who fulfills it, and he's the one that receives life in consequence of that. So that's a, a fairly distinctive Christological reading then of Leviticus 18.5, the one who does these things will live by them. Now, verse 13 then, uh, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole, Deuteronomy 21, 23. What does that mean? So I see this as Christ conquered death, the ultimate curse of Torah. So he passed through the curse of Torah in order to uh, gain the... So as he then receives life, he then receives the authority to give life through the Spirit, which is the very thing promised in the Torah itself, which then means that the curse of the Torah is no longer applicable to the one who receives the life and the Spirit of Christ. So as that that's the end of all of this, that Christ is the one who lives by fidelity. Christ is the one who did these things, specifically in order that Christ would have power over death that he then can give to those who follow him. So I think that's the, the conclusion of the, of the passage. 
All right, then, yeah, fi- Paul ends by saying, He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So circling back around finally then, um, as you did a great job on an exegetical speed round, what does this all mean for the phrase, the Messiah is the end of the law in <laughs> Romans 10.4? Yeah, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's sort of funny because these are the, you know, the greatest hits of uh, the, the hardest passages in, in, in Paul. And well, that's, your, that's what your book tries to do, right? Yep. That's, uh, you, you started out by saying, I'm going to read the most difficult texts in Paul and show you how I can make them coherent. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty bold <laughs> move, but um, I think you, you do something quite promising in the book. Uh, you, you, you deliver, I think, quite, quite well on your promise. So what is uh, the Messiah is the end of uh, the, the telos namu? What does Paul mean by that? First of all, what is the very last independent clause of the Torah? What is the actual end of the Torah? Got me. Just give a beat there for listeners who, who might really know their Torah. The last independent clause of the Torah is this. Since that day, no prophet like Moses has arisen in Israel. Now, what's really interesting is that that word arisen is the, in, in the Septuagint, it's translated with a form of uh, 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 anastas- anastasis, basically, right? Anistemi. Right. This is a word that's used for resurrection in the New Testament. Right. So the very last thing the Torah does is say, yeah, so prophet like Moses has not yet arisen. Well, that signals back to Deuteronomy 18, right in the middle of the book where the promise is made. I will raise up a prophet like you from among their brothers, and it will be that whoever does not listen to my words, which he speaks in my name, I will myself require it of him. So the very last word of the Torah is saying, yeah, since that point, the prophet like Moses, who the very thing that this book promises has not yet arisen. What Paul is saying is Jesus is that prophet like Moses, that Deuteronomy promises, but concludes the last word of the book is that that prophet hasn't, ha- hasn't arisen yet. And Paul then says, hey, by the way, Jesus has arisen. He's actually, the prophet like Moses has risen. He's the one who has authority and must be obeyed. He's the one to whom allegiance must be pledged. He's the one uh, who to whom uh, every mouth must confess and and every heart must uh, you know every every mouth must pledge allegiance and every heart uh, must commit to follow because he's also the revealer and deliverer of, deliverer of the heavenly Torah and right after. Romans 10, 4, where he says, Messiah is the end of the Torah or is the, the, the culmination of the Torah. He said, he, he quotes Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14, where, you know, do not say in your heart, right? He's got that little introduction who will ascend to heaven to, uh, that is to bring Christ down, right? You, you've got this whole thing. And there's been a lot of debate over why would he quote this passage, which seems so inapplicable to the argument that he's making, but it's not inapplicable because if you read Deuteronomy 30 carefully, verses 11 through 14 are the result. They're the consequence of the first 10 verses of Deuteronomy 30, which is, I will circumcise your hearts and you, uh, so that you will love me and you will live. And then when you get to verse 11, it says the, the, the Torah at that point, see, the Torah that I'm promising or that I'm, that I'm teaching you today, the, the command that I'm giving you today will not be too difficult for you. Now, this gets obscured a lot in modern translations because it's decided that, he, that Moses is saying that to the people at present that, see, the command I'm giving you today is not too difficult for you now. But he's just said just a, a, few, a few verses earlier, it's too difficult for you. You're not going to keep this. And he says that a few verses later. But, but he says in the context of uh, 31 through 10, when all of that has happened, the, the command that I'm giving you today will not be too difficult for you because see, it will be in your mouth and in your heart. And Paul says, this is what has happened because the prophet like Moses has descended and ascended already to bring down the hev- the very heavenly Torah that Moses was experiencing on the mountain. Jesus now has brought down and put into the hearts of those who have the spirit. Therefore, the command that God has commanded to love Adonai, your God, is not too difficult anymore. 
Now, now is the time of promise. And so the, the, the promise of the very last promise, the very last thing that the Torah is talking about and the very thing to which the Torah is ultimately signaling as the, the ultimate promise of God, Paul says, this is found in Christ. And so when he says Christ is the end of Torah or is the culmination of Torah, because telos can, can mean either one, and I think he means both in that sense, that's what he's talking about, is that the ultimate promise of the Torah, that is to be obedient to God from the inside out, is fulfilled and enabled through the spirit that's given by the one like Moses. And I think that's the whole point of Romans 10, is to get is to draw attention to the role of Jesus as this prophet like Moses, who is the new lawgiver, but not just the giver of, a, of some written Torah, but actually the one who brings down the Torah itself and puts it in the hearts of the people who are not on the top of the mountain. He brings the top of the mountain down to the people, essentially. Wow, uh, that's uh, powerfully said. Um, I know your time is running short, as I want to be respectful of that. Um, uh, do you have one more uh, time for one more question, maybe from Aaron? If Aaron has one more, I, mean, I don't know. I have so many questions, but um, I'll just ask this one because it was one that was not in the book. And I just would love to hear your thoughts on it. When Paul at the end of Galatians. Oh, no. It's a quick one, though. But when Paul in Galatians gives this like hat tip to the Israel of God, why does he do that? And what does it mean? Oh, OK. <laughs> um, so here's where I'm going to I'm going to say something. So Gordon Fee, I think, uh, once once put it well here. Uh, where he said, if you if you add uh, the of God here, the the adding the the um, clarificatory aspect of this is unnecessary unless there's unless to imply that there is another Israel that is something other than the Israel of God. Uh, and Fee points out that there is another uh, another place where Paul talks about Israel according to the flesh, katasarka. And I think that's what Paul's talking about. Paul distinguishes between the Israel of God, that is those who have the spirit and are participating in the uh, restoration life. You know, this is an eschatological uh, distinction that he's talking about. You know, if you, if you would prefer eschatological Israel, uh, as opposed to those who are just ex Israel, those who are just descended from Israel or Israel katasarka, uh, and, you know, he's distinguishing between the assembly of God or the Israel of God. And this of God language is something that we see a lot in um, in the Torah, you know, that, that Israel is the, uh, the, the Kahal, you know, Adonai, for example. I think he's distinguishing it that way, that he's referring specifically to those who are part of eschatological Israel, who are reci- receiving the promises of Israel and are heirs of those promises. So, yeah, that's a that's a sort of quick and dirty of that. Thank you so much, Jason. We've been talking to Jason Staples, who's assistant teaching professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at North Carolina State University. He's the author of the book we've been discussing, Paul and the Resurrection of Israel, uh, as well as an earlier book, The Idea of Israel in Second Temple Judaism. Um, And so uh, we hope you've enjoyed the episode, and uh, we hope you come back and listen some more. If you'd like to support us uh, through purchases, you can follow the link to Jason's book, on our webpage, www.onscript.study. Thanks for listening. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study donate. 